much for having me, first of all. I am absolutely delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be leading a delegation of parliamentarians of all parties here to Kurdistan. It's historic. It's the very first time the Parliament of Canada has been able to send a delegation. And I think the starting point for us is to learn from you, learn about your culture, learn about your democratic institutions. We've been having meetings with your ministers and your government from all the different political parties. We're hoping to get to every single party that's a member of the government as well. And then we're going to have a meeting with civic organizations and think tanks, uh, journalists as well, and really have a parliament-to-parliament -parliament relationship with Kurdistan. Governments can talk to each other whenever they want to. Back home, uh, I'm a member of the opposition. I, I'm not a member of any government. But it's important to have a people-to-people -people relationships, and that's what we're building here in Kurdistan. It's actually my first visit to Kurdistan, to Bashur, but in the case of one of our delegate members, it's actually his second time. He was back here in 2017 and was actually an observer for the referendum. Well, you know, friends back home who are of Kurdish origins, who are, you know, good Canadians today, who keep talking about Kurdistan and how great it is, delicious food, uh, very welcoming and uh, hospitable people. Uh, I always uh, thought, okay, well, you know, that's the one story that we're getting in Canada, but then you come here and you get to actually live the experience, which is very important for us who are politicians in Canada to be able to say, well, actually, what I've been told by the diaspora community of Kurdish people in Canada, it matches up pretty closely to what's going on on the ground. It's extremely safe. We were, you know, out in the community walking around and we were able to meet people and, you know, to exchange with people. Uh, and it, it feels safe. It feels just like you were in certain parts of Canada and sometimes you really can't tell the difference. That, I think, is uh, a, you know, a good message that we can bring back to Canadians, which is, although our government has a, you know, a security notice and safety notice for people when they're coming to Iraq in general, that's not entirely what's true on the ground. On the ground, things are extremely safe, and people should be you know, considering traveling to northern Iraq, to Kurdistan more often. So uh, over the next few days, we have uh, you know, issues of security that we've both been wanting to raise. Uh, issues of cooperation between different political parties that we've wanted to raise as well because we think the unity of Kurdistan is extremely important to its future, to its people, and to these uh, democratic institutions that have basically been custom built by Kurdish people in Kurdistan, in Bashur. Uh, we've been wanting to raise the case and the plight of the Yazidis who are, you know, uh, have fled Shangal, who are still in refugee camps. And the plight of the Yazidis back home in Canada is extremely important. It was a conservative motion in the Canadian Parliament that uh, recognized the genocide of the Yazidis by Daesh. It was a conservative motion that called on our Canadian government to accept Yazidi refugees to Canada. That was actually a motion I co-sponsored in the Parliament. I also worked on the report on how we could resettle Yazidis. And just today we met with uh, the Barzani Charity Foundation and that was one of the main issues we want to talk about with them. And we're looking forward to having more of those types of exchanges because the plight of the Yazidis uh, is extremely important in Canada, like I mentioned, and we want to ensure that we are doing everything we can on the ground, both to resettle ref Yazidi refugees to Canada and to reunite families. Because we have Yazidi families that came to Canada, we want those families to be reunited. And that's kind of the last missing part of the puzzle for us. Uh, five years ago, many Yazidis came to Canada. Many of them are now Canadian citizens, and they're missing their family members who are still here. So we want to complete the circle. We want to reunite those families. And many of us on the delegation, that, that is one of the main issues we want to talk about with the Kurdistan government, which is how can we make it happen? So uh, oftentimes when I hear the, the strife or the conflict between Baghdad and Erbil and Haller, I think uh, many Kurds call it that way. Uh, it's very similar to the types of uh, difference of opinion you have between Ottawa, our nation's capital, and the different provincial capitals and their provincial governments. There's always going to be a back and forth and a debate and a discussion and disagreements over what does the Constitution say and how do you implement the Constitution, how do you respect the, the words are written into the Constitution. I come from Western Canada. I'm an Albertan. We have had a centuries-long conflict with the central government over the right to our natural resources, which is very similar to what Kurdistan has with Baghdad. Uh, you know, we have on the delegation as well two members from uh, the bloc who are, uh, you know, Quebec nationalists. And they've had a disagreement with their government in Ottawa as well. Those are normal to have in a federation, as long as they're non-violent debates, they're peaceful debates, and at the very end of the day, politicians can debate between each other whatever they want. They can pass the laws or sometimes in conflict with the Constitution, and then you take it to a court. 
and then you let the court decide. And once the court, as the referee in, in a you know, federation, decides who is right, then you should implement those decisions that the courts have decided. And then there's still room, I think, for dialogue between all the parties. And as long as the parties are united in ensuring that you're doing what's best for people on the ground, that you have the best results in mind, then I, I think you have the right direction, the right purpose. And those, those types of disagreements are, are normal. And I think in the cases, what we've heard so far is that some of the disagreements between uh, the capital uh, here in the KRI and uh, Baghdad goes beyond that, that uh, Baghdad is trying to uh, have more control. There needs to be space for autonomy, obviously. Uh, and that happens in Canada all the time. The central government allows pro our provinces to have entire areas of jurisdiction where they're allowed to do whatever they want in education, for example, control over their natural resources, uh, provincial taxation. So these are areas where we found basically an ability for the federal government to not be involved and to allow our province to do what it wants to do. I think that will eventually come to Kurdistan as you debate with uh, Baghdad, you know, the, the, where does the constitution start and begin and how should it be interpreted? So, I mean, if you want to talk about language, I think the Quebec government would disagree. They would say they haven't been implemented because there are fundamental charter rights that were recognized and enshrined in our constitution in the very early 1980s. We have a charter of rights and freedoms that entrenches language rights as rights that all Canadians should enjoy. But we've also instituted something called the notwithstanding clause, section 33 of our constitution that says under certain conditions, those rights do not apply. And, and I know this because I actually grew up in Quebec despite representing a Western uh, Canadian writing. Uh, in the province of Quebec, you are allowed to suspend certain language rights under certain conditions. And that's what the Quebec government has chosen to do. And so there is still a conflict between the federal government and the province over how exactly can you uh, reduce someone's rights or limit someone's rights because you're trying to protect the common rights of the Quebec people and the language rights that they enjoy to speak in French because there's still a significant English language minority in the province of Quebec, especially on the island of Montreal. So, but Getting to that point has taken decades of debating back and forth with politicians because and at the end of the day, they still believe in the rule of law, which is politicians can disagree, they can pass laws, uh, and if there's a disagreement in the contents of the law, they have to go to court, and then the court gets to decide who has gone too far and how much space is there to have a disagreement and who is the final decider on what a person can, you know, be what language you can be educated in or what language can you get service in.